good morning, Coach Barry Church. We're so glad you decided to worship with us. I'd love to invite you to stand and sing these first couple songs with us.
We are so glad that you're here. Turn to those around you. Say good morning. I'm glad that you're here. We're going to take you back a little old school. Is that okay?
morning. It is good to see all of you this morning. I'm Anna, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury, and we are thrilled to have you all today. I'm also thrilled that Morgan and Quentin McKenzie are here with their beautiful family, and many of you know um, Morgan and Quentin. They've been around Cokesbury for a while, but today they are taking an exciting next step, and Cadence and Anna are getting baptized this morning, so we are so excited about that. And... um, Morgan and Quentin, I have questions for you all first, and the question is, do you all accept Jesus Christ as your own Savior? Are you following Jesus, and do you reject Satan and his ways and desire to follow Jesus? And do you want to have your children baptized? And will you commit to raise them so that when it's time, they can say yes to Jesus themselves? Okay, now this is your part. I need all of you all to stand up. Because when we take next steps, we never take those next steps by ourselves. And when we baptize children, this is a moment where we are acknowledging that God has already said yes to Cadence and to Anna and to all of us. And that we are saying yes to the grace and love that's being offered to them. But I also need to ask you if you all will be a part of helping to raise Cadence and Anna in the faith. If you will make sure that you are there for the McKenzie family and surround them with your love and your prayers as they raise their children in this church and help to introduce these girls to Jesus as they take next steps throughout their whole life. If you will, will you say a hearty amen? Amen. Okay. Cadence, you're going to go first, okay? (laughs) Cadence has already felt the water. She knows it's a little cold. But Cadence, the reason we put this water on your head is because it is a reminder that God loves you and has chosen you as his daughter and that he will always love you and care for you. So Cadence, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anna, this water is because God loves you, because God chooses you. And and I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you all would, give them a round of applause. If you would, bow your heads. I'd love to say a prayer um, over the McKenzie family before we continue worshiping together. God, I'm so thankful for Quentin and Morgan and Cadence and Anna and all of the people that love and support them, including all the people in this room. God, we pray over these precious young women that you would continue to show them your love in a million ways through their parents, through this church, throughout their life, that they would always know without a doubt that they are loved by God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Bye. 
Well, good morning again. It is so great to see all of you. If today's your first day at Cokesbury, welcome. I'm so glad that you came. I hope that you will stop by guest services and let us um, say hello to you and get to know you. If you are joining us for the first time online, you can join in with us in the chat and let us know um, that you're here. But if you all would say good morning and welcome to the people worshiping online today, give them a round of applause. It is great to have everybody with us, including our kids and our students who are gonna be dismissed now. If you are um, grades fifth and sixth, you are dismissed um, to your banner over here. If you are K through um, one, you're in the back. If you're two through four, you're over here in the side. Um, these kids and students are going to Cokesbury Kids and Cokesbury Students to areas and lessons designed specifically for them and their age group to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. So if you're new, or your kids haven't been to Cokesbury Kids, you can go with them, check out, see what that's all about, and they can let you know more about that. But we have an incredible team of people who love your kids and your students and continue to pour into their lives every week so that they'll learn more about who Jesus is and what that means in their own life. We got to be a part just a minute ago of a baptism and a special next step. And it may be that for you, baptism is your next step. So I wanted to let you know that we are going to have a baptism Sunday um, coming up at the end of May. And listen, you can be baptized any week of the year. So you don't have to wait for baptism Sunday. If that's a day that you're not gonna be here, let us know. We would love to talk to you about your next steps. But there will be other people getting baptized that day. So if that's something that would um, be exciting for you to be a part of, if you've never been baptized before, let us know. We can give you more information about that. Um, we will, you can do it by immersion, you can do it by sprinkling, whatever way is most comfortable for you. Um, but it's gonna be a special day where people are able to take their faith public and say um, that, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I wanna go public with that profession of faith. So if you've never been baptized, let us know and we can talk to you more about that, but I hope you'll be a part of it. You may not know this, but two weeks from today is Mother's Day. And I know some of you, that is a little bit of panic in your heart and you're writing that down. But um, I have good news for you that we will, as is our tradition at Cokesbury Church, be taking up a special offering on Mother's Day for Susanna's House, which is a ministry to moms and their children, moms who are in recovery. Um, and that is something that Cokesbury has been a part of since the day that that ministry began. It's very near and dear to us. So if you want to honor your own mom or a mother figure in your life, you can go ahead now now, um, on the app or on the website, you can give to the Susanna's House special offering, or we'll have a way to give on that day. But if you do, if you want to give in honor of someone that you love, you can also pick up a card for them at guest services um, today or any day that you're here. And you can give that card um, to someone special in your life on Mother's Day and said, hey, the way I honored you this year is by helping moms who are in need. If you are giving online to that Mother's Day offering and you can't come by here and get a card, we will send you a digital card that you can either send or print um, as well. So got your Mother's Day um, needs taken care of there and you will get to help um, take care of other moms who are in need as well. So it's a win-win for everybody. So we hope that you will be a part of that and help us to continue to love and support Susanna's house. Right now we're gonna take up our morning's offering as we do every time that we get together. And I wanna say thank you, you guys are so faithful to give. Some of you give online, some of you give in the boxes around the room, some of you will be giving when the basket goes by, but I just wanna thank you for your faithfulness in giving so that God can continue to use this place, that we can continue to be a part of hope and healing in Knoxville and beyond. So thank you for that. Let's pray together as we take up this morning's offering. God, we come to you today grateful for another day of life, grateful for the blessings that you've surrounded us with. Some, some of us are having a really tough week, some of us are having a great week, but God, we thank you that no matter where we are in that, that you meet us right there. God, please use these gifts that somebody would come to know Jesus Christ as their own savior this week, that someone would find hope and forgiveness and healing and peace because of the work of this church family in this community. God, we ask that you would bless this offering, that you would multiply it. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. that bring 
bring me back to life And everything's gonna be alright Everything's gonna be alright You hold me in your arms Till my storm is calm And everything's gonna be alright Everything's gonna be all right yeah. You are the strength When I am weak The only one that leads my soul To perfect peace yeah. And I will sing my way Through the So that was awkward, sorry about that. A little uh, weird interlude there. Um, my name is Stephen, I'm the senior pastor here at Cokesbury, and if this is your first time with us, really glad that you guys are here. Um, if you're new, if I could communicate one thought clearly about who we wanna be, it would be what Josh just saying, that we are a group of people who gather together under the name of Jesus, believing that ultimately everything's gonna be okay. Um, because I believe that. And uh, today we're gonna be in this series we're calling To Be Continued, where we're going, looking at what happened after Easter, and we're working our way through parts of the book of Acts. And so if you've got your Bible with you, which, let me say this, I love seeing people bring their Bibles. I've noticed over the past few weeks, we're getting more and more people doing that. Um, we're gonna be in Acts chapter six, Acts chapter seven. The beauty is you got it right there on your phone, if you'd like to pull it up and read it for yourself, and then obviously it's gonna be on the screen uh, as well. And I, I just wanna, 
Uh, I normally never do this, but I just want to kind of say up front that today's going to be a heavy message for some of us. Uh, it just is. And um, we planned these series a couple of months in advance, and I had no idea that um, when it came time for this particular message and passage of Scripture that it would even touch my own family um, because Beth and I have been going through a little bit of the fire with, with a family health issue ourselves. And so um, I just want to say, if you don't hear anything else that I say today, um, it's that core belief, it's going to be okay because God is in control. And so I'd like to ask if you would to join me in just a moment of prayer. Gracious God, I, I give you thanks for the gift of this day, and I thank you that um, we have made it through another week, and we're gathered here under this roof, and we're gathered online, and um, God, I just am grateful that we have the ability to do that. And so I just, I just know that today um, you've got plans for us, that, that we didn't just wake up and make a decision we're gonna to come to church, that through the power of your spirit, you've wooed all of us all week long, preparing us to be here under, uh, in this very moment. And so, Lord, I just pray that um, you will continue to move among us, that you'll open our hearts and our minds, that you'll speak deep into the depths of our souls, that this won't just be um, a moment where we think or where we feel challenged or where we feel your grace, but let it be rocket fuel to help us take a step forward in our life and in our relationship with you. And God, if nothing else happens today, would you, would you give us the assurance that, man, we, we had a chance to stand on holy ground in your presence, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. So today I wanna talk to those of us um, who are in the struggle. <laughs> and I don't know what situation you might feel like you're facing, but it's for those who feel like, man, I, I might be in over my head. Maybe it's a job situation, um, maybe it's a physical confrontation, maybe it's a spiritual battle that you've been wrestling with, maybe it's a financial setback that you didn't see coming, maybe it's a relational or a health challenge that you just didn't really see it coming, and because you didn't see it coming, it can be overwhelming, and you feel like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm, it's that person that I wanna talk about. And so the question is, what do you do when you're faced with what feels like an absolutely impossible situation? Now, some of us are gonna lean in really closely because that's exactly where we're living right now. And then there'll be others of us that is not where you're living right now and you're gonna be tempted to kind of zone out. And I just wanna ask you to not do that. It's 25 minutes. Stay focused because I got good news and bad news. <laughs> the bad news is if you're not going through it, you will go through it. <laughs> That's just a part of being a human being and living in a broken, sin-stained world. But the good news is, I think we got some principles that are gonna be powerful in that moment when it comes. And so if you're a note taker, I encourage you, they're gonna seem simple, but you need to write these down because I promise you, God has given us some stuff that's really powerful. And these principles show up in the story of a guy named Stephen. Now, it's hard when you're a preacher named Stephen to talk about Stephen because it's gonna be a third person Stephen. Well, this ain't Stephen defer, this is Stephen in the scriptures. And we find his story in Acts chapter six and chapter seven. It comes at a pivotal moment in the life of the early church. And uh, let me say this up front. His story, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's gonna seem a little distant and maybe abstract, uh, maybe even a little weird to some of us. But how he responded to the circumstance he faced is what I need us as a community to latch onto today. Now, we don't know a lot about Stephen. Um, so let me kind of set the stage. Um, when we get to Acts chapter six, we've got this startup church that's gone absolutely crazy. Like they started out with 120 people and then God unleashed his Holy Spirit upon them and people were being added to the church every single day. And I'm not talking one or two families show up, I'm talking 2,000 people in one day. And it is the church just goes from 120 to 2,120. And then the next day, um, one of the apostles would get up and preach and there'd be 3,000 or 4,000 people. And so you, this thing's just going crazy 
in a very short amount of time. And if you've ever had a startup business, you know it can be a little or maybe a lot wild, right? Like you got this idea and you get all fired up about it and um, then you find yourself working in the details because it's just you. You're answering the phones, you're out making sales calls, you're making sure the product's there. I mean, everything is on your shoulders and you're trying to make this thing a reality. And so you end up getting up way too early and you stay up way too late and uh, you're just working and working and working and eventually you face complete exhaustion, but you know that nothing you're doing is actually helping this thing stay up. And eventually, just because of the sheer pace of it, you start kind of unintentionally overlooking some really, really important details. Well, that's what's going on at this point in the book of Acts. It says that the leaders, the apostles, are beginning to overlook the ministry specifically with widows. Now, apparently, there was a fairly exhaustive list of widows. And uh, it was the religious community in that day, it was their responsibility to take care of the widows because they had no backstop in that society. And so if there's gonna be any help or any healing or any real sense of hope for a future, it was up to the church. And so that was beginning to get overlooked. And there were lots of complaining. I know it's weird that a church complained. I, it, that doesn't happen in our day, but... Um, People are getting angry and they're lifting up their voices in frustration. And so the leaders decide that they gotta do something about it. And that's where we're gonna pick up the story in Acts chapter six, verse two. It says, so the 12, those are the first apostles, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, this is not demeaning widows but they understand that they've gotta stay focused on what only they can do. And we're all susceptible to this, right? Like, it is so easy with everything that's going on in most of our lives to get off what we need to be doing and get focused on um, things that other people can do. I'm sure you're that way in your job. It is that way in my job. One of the chief things I do is try to keep our staff focused on you do what only you can do and then you train somebody else to do what they can do, and it's a way of, of sharing the workload. And I think that we all face that from time to time. That's what's going on here. And so here's their solution. Verse three, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit and six others whose names are weird and hard to pronounce. Uh, verse six, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So apparently, you've got this group of people and uh, as we read through this story, they start doing a really good job. Because we hear in verse seven it says, so the word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so because they had picked these seven and they were the right seven, things are back on track. Now, just as, as an aside, one of the things I see in this that I think speaks to all of us is that you don't have to be at the top of the org, org chart to have a major impact on the outcome of what's going on. In fact, you may literally be waiting tables. And you may wonder sometimes, is my job making a difference? Like, why does this even matter? Or maybe you're involved in ministry, whether it's here or somewhere else, and it feels like you're way down the food chain and you wonder, does anybody care or does this really matter? <laughs> well, from what I'm seeing right here, the answer is yes, of course it matters. I mean, look right here. Stephen is doing a great job. He's waiting on tables. He's taking care of widows, and that would seem to most to be way beyond, below his qualifications, but he does it well. He puts his whole heart into it, and the entire community is lifted up and made better because of his willingness to simply get after it. And I believe that that's something that you and I as Christians, we ought to do every single day, y'all. 
wherever we are, whether it's in business or at school or if we're out in the community or if we show up here at church, we should do everything we can to lift the organization because it does not matter where we are, everything we do, we should do as if we're doing it unto the Lord. That's the bottom line. That ought to be a key characteristic of what people in our community see in us. We may not be perfect, we may not always say the right thing, but we're gonna do everything we can to build ourselves in to the community and the people around us and do what we can to lift them up. And listen, I know it's hard to lift some people up. It just is. You may be with somebody right now that's hard to lift them up. Don't focus on them, focus on the fact that what you do and how you act and the things you say You're doing it on behalf of God. I don't know, man, it just feels like that might make a difference. Well, that's what Stephen did. And as a result, God blessed him and he brought him more response, brought more responsibility in his life, verse eight. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So he started out waiting on tables Because he did a good job with it, God brought blessing into his life, gave him more responsibility, and now he's at a place where he's performing wonders and signs among all the people. It's amazing, it's wild. (laughs) Now you would think when other people saw this, right, because they're a part of this movement that's going on, you think they'd be like, wow, man, that is awesome. Look at Stephen, he is letting it rip. God is so good. But unfortunately, that's not what they did. (laughs) Verse nine. Opposition arose, of course it did. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen who began to argue with Stephen. So he's doing all these great things and it's building up the community and it's pushing the movement forward and the first thing he faces is opposition. So here's here's the first real principle for us. If you decide to do the extraordinary, somebody's gonna step up and try to cut you down. Bottom line, if you say, you know what, I'm gonna make something out of my life. I'm gonna do my best at school. I'm gonna do the best I can as an employer or an employee. I'm gonna step out of my addiction and begin to pursue sobriety. I'm gonna choose not to participate in the gossip sesh at work or on Facebook. Whatever you decide to do, if it's at a step forward in your life, there's always gonna be somebody who wants to try to cut you down. In fact, it has been said that the only way to avoid criticism, y'all know this, is do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. You gotta keep putting one foot in front of the other. Don't let the critics have more power in your life than they actually deserve. Because here's what I found about critics. Most critics are critics because they lack the spine or the guts to do what you've stepped up to do. So they gotta tear everybody down around them to make themselves feel better. Stephen is like, I'm not gonna do that. (laughs) I'm not gonna let a little criticism stop me from doing something really great for God. I'm not gonna let uh, my God-sized project be stopped by a bunch of noisy project inspectors. Now, just to drive this principle home, because I think it's really important, Stephen got to a place where he cared more about making a difference than simply fitting in. Now, that's a word for somebody. Some of us are encountering criticism for the good things that we're doing and we're wondering to ourselves, is it really worth it? What I'd say to you is go for it. (laughs) There ain't no hall of fame for critics. They're easily forgotten. It's the difference makers among us whose legacy will be built that will far outlive us and never fade away. So you just keep on doing what God's asking you to do and you let God deal with the critics. You gotta kinda put some spiritual blinders on when you get up in the morning and you just gotta push all that negativity away. And one of the ways you do that is you stay connected to God and you keep feeding your soul with God's voice and not the voice of those outside. So just keep putting one foot in front of the other. That's what Stephen did, verse 10 but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So notice what's going on, right? He ignored the critics. 
And so they started just blanket making stuff up. They brought him before the Sanhedrin and they put him on trial based on pure lies. Now that's Acts chapter six. In Acts chapter seven, we get Stephen's response to those accusations. It's about 50 verses, right? So we're not gonna read it. It's about 50 verses. You can check it out for yourself. And what he does is he just goes back over all of Israel's history. He talks about Moses, talks about Abraham, and he uses that um, to kind of prove uh, the basis for his desire to follow God's plan. And then he gets to the end of all of that, and basically what he says is, if you look at our history, every time God sent a, pr a prophet, you destroyed them. You persecuted them, you vilified them, you sent them out and you stoned them every single time. If you look back over the history of our nation, you did that and you just did it again. God sent Jesus to make a way and you killed him. <laughs> now, as you might imagine, that did not thrill his accusers, right? And uh, so then it gets even worse. And this gets at the heart of what I want us to look at today is what do you do when you're facing impossible circumstances? I see three things in here in, Jesus, in uh, Stephen's response that I really do think can help us. The first one is simple, it's look up. Acts seven, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven. Now this one right here, this is so crucial. I think the first thing that you need to do when you're faced with a tough situation where it feels like you're over your head or um, the situation is, is causing you to dig into more reserves than you feel like you have, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta get your eyes focused in the right direction. You guys understand this. Perspective really is everything. In fact, I would argue that our future happiness depends on what it is that we're actually looking at. The text says that Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I really do believe that there's a special work of the Holy Spirit for Christians when we're in crisis. And again, it might be a severe financial crisis, it might be a severe health crisis, it could be some relational crisis that you're going through, whatever it is, there's a specific work of the Holy Spirit for those exact moments. It's, it's, it's the grace to get us through things that we were never capable of getting through on our own. It's that feeling of it's gonna be okay even though you've got no rational reason to believe it's gonna be okay. We see this in Acts. It says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And so when he saw Jesus, it put his situation in, into perspective. And maybe Stephen started to think, this may be the end of my earthly life, but there's a lot more ahead for me. The truth is, you may be facing it right now. There may be somebody in your life that pronounced a death sentence over your body or your relationship or maybe your career or your family or your finances. And if that's you, I just want to invite you to do what Stephen did. It's just simply look up and see Jesus. Well, why would I say that? Because we all know that, right? Listen, I've been around Christians a long time. There is a tendency when it feels like the rug is being ripped out from under us, some of us, we don't lean into God, we run away from God. And I think the reality is God has gotten a lot more blame than God deserves. We live in a broken, sin-stained world. We are imperfect people. Stuff happens, bad stuff happens. And so when the bad stuff comes, you gotta look up and see Jesus. In Colossians 3, Paul put it like this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So if you're here today and you're discouraged, you need to look up. <laughs> If you're at a point in your life where you're a little bit unhappy or maybe you're a lot unhappy, start looking up. If you're scared, look up. If you feel overwhelmed, look up. If you feel lost or hopeless, get your eyes looking up. If you feel like the deck is stacked against you, 
Just simply look up and set your mind on things above. You can't stay a victim your whole life. The only way to become a victor is to look ahead and see that Jesus is right there in the midst of that darkness. See, when you set your minds on things above, over time, what looks like the end starts to begin like God doing a work in your life. So look up. Number two is look ahead. Look up, look ahead. When you and I start looking around, when we should be looking ahead, that's when a lot of trouble starts to surface. I am sure that in this moment, Stephen was tempted to look around and maybe start comparing his circumstance with the circumstances of those around him. And the reason I say that is back in Acts chapter five, there's this whole group of leaders who were doing the exact same thing Stephen was doing. And they made people mad and people put them on trial and they got arrested. But unlike Stephen, an angel showed up and set them free. So I can imagine at least once, Stephen was tempted to think, where's my angel? <laughs> like it, it ain't happening in my life, what, what, what did I do? to not deserve the same response. You and I do the same thing, don't we? We get confronted with a tough situation or a tough circumstance and we start that questioning of why me? What did I do? How did I mess up? Where's my angel? See, when we do that, it leaves us in waves of self-pity and we're ultimately no better off. In tough circumstances, you and I have got to train ourselves to look ahead we got to look ahead and begin to say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to run the race that God has set before me. I'm not going to be thrilled about it. It's not necessarily something that's bringing life into me, but I'm going to do what I can to stay in my lane. I can't second guess this thing all day long. I'm going to be looking at Jesus and I'm going to trust God for the outcome, whatever that outcome might be. That's hard, right? because you and I are not hardwired to do that. That's why I think it shows up in the book of Acts. It requires the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when you're going through it and it feels like your back's against the wall or somebody's pronounced a death sentence on you, none of us are strong enough to handle that on our own. It doesn't matter how many people we're surrounded by. It takes an invasion of the Holy Spirit to get us the strength that we need to keep on keeping on because as human beings, it's too easy to just simply give up. But we gotta keep looking ahead. And here's what Stephen saw when he looked ahead, verse 56. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In other words, he saw Jesus advocating on his behalf. And what's interesting is his circumstance did not change. In fact, <laughs> it got worse because they took him out and they began to stone him. And there's this guy standing there. And the Bible says that they all laid their jackets at his feet, which means he's the leader. And his name just happened to be Saul. Now I wanna take a little liberty here because I've often wondered in moments like this, what do you think Jesus was saying? I mean, this is this legit intense moment. I don't know if it's this, but maybe it was something like this. Father, that's Stephen. <laughs> you remember him. He's full of the Holy Spirit. We lifted him, up, lifted him up and he did well with all that he was given. He worked mir miracles and he preached the gospel. And now he's standing before men who are gonna stone him. This is the end of his life, but it is not the end end. Look at that guy there, that's Saul. This is his first encounter with a Christian like Stephen. And Stephen doesn't know it, but in the next few seconds, they are gonna be the most important seconds of his entire life. Because his response is going to impact Saul. And Saul's going to have an encounter with me in just a couple of days, and he's gonna become Paul. And he's gonna become the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. He's going to win millions and millions and millions of souls to the gospel, all because of Stephen's response in this exact moment. And when it's over, I'm gonna bring him home. 
See, friends, here's what I know about your current situation. No matter how tough it is, if you will look up and you will look ahead, God will use it for his glory and he will turn it for your good. In fact, Saul, who became Paul, went on to say this. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Where do you think Paul happened to see that for the very first time? It was Stephen. See, the point is, you got no idea who's waiting in the wings. You just look up and you keep looking ahead and somebody's gonna see that and the impact that you're gonna make is gonna be more than you could ever imagine. One thing I am positive of is that God does not cause the crisis, but God will never waste a crisis. God is working even when it feels like he's not. God does love us even though there are moments where it feels like there's nobody on the planet that loves us. God does have our best interest at heart but sometimes it may be even bigger than we are. And there are people out there who are gonna come into the saving grace of Jesus Christ just because they watched us go through something. Which brings me to the last one, which is simply look back. <clears throat> Not looking back at what could have been or what should have been, but just look back and take one final look is there any unfinished business? Look at how it worked itself out with Stephen. While they were stoning him, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. It's forgiveness. The Holy Spirit working in Stephen's life allowed him to say the one thing that most of us struggle with. God, even though they're doing something really awful, don't hold it against them. If there's one skill that I think we all need to learn, it's the skill to forgive because you can't operate in this world without understanding forgiveness. I don't know what unfinished business you might have in your life. But y'all, life is incredibly fragile. And in the grand scheme of things, it's a blip on the radar. And there's one thing that has been reinforced in my life over the past couple of weeks is you ain't guaranteed tomorrow. So you can't put that unfinished business off. You gotta deal with it now. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's an email you need to send, maybe it's uh, uh, somebody you need to go visit. I, I don't know what it is, there's some thing. We've all got this unfinished business and it's human nature to go, well, I'll deal with it tomorrow, but what if you don't get tomorrow? So deal with it today. Believe it or not, as dark as this story is, there is some hope and it's right there in verse 60. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, here it is, he fell asleep. <laughs> See, it's hope that at the end of my life and your life, or at the end of the life of someone we love, we simply fall asleep and we wake up with Jesus in eternity. There's hope, y'all. There's possibility. And I know some of y'all, you're going through the fire. And I want you to know that this is not some trite, you ought to go do something. This is a pathway toward freedom. Because the truth is on this side of heaven, there's so much that you and I don't understand and we'll never understand. And listen, um, I think for some of us, God's got a lot to answer for in your life. And the good news is, God's big enough to handle it. And you'll have an opportunity to ask those questions. And if you're wrestling with that right now, it's okay to wrestle with that. Welcome to being a human being. 
But I want you to know the altars of our church are always open. And when we give this call, I know sometimes, um, depending on what you're dealing with in your life, you can look up and you can see an empty altar and you can go, man, that's, that's the loneliest place I could imagine being right now because what if I'm the only person? Well, over the course of my life, I've learned to flip that around. I think this is the most powerful place because it's here that we meet God. It's here that brothers and sisters see us step out knowing maybe not what our circumstance is, but there really are people in this room. When, when people get up, they immediately start praying on their behalf. It doesn't necessarily fix the situation, but it is a place to start a conversation or to continue that conversation. And so today, y'all, it's your time. I know some of y'all, your shoulders are heavy and, and maybe part of that burden can be lifted right now. And if that's too much, you can make an altar out of the chair where you're sitting. If you're sitting at home, your den or wherever you are, this is the time because we have a good God who's madly head over heels in love with every single one of us. And the good news is you don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to have all the right answers. You just gotta open up your heart just enough for God's spirit to come in and he'll meet you right here. And so you come now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
time this morning. I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. We love you. We'll see you back next week. Goodbye.